Hey y'all, it's Cherokee Starfish, back with a new series this Saturday for you. It's my first blind playthrough on the channel chosen by y'all, Betrayal in Antara. So, um, yeah. I don't know anything about this game, really. Um, I have played Betrayal at Krondor, which was made by the same folks. Um, you may or may not remember Dynamics, which is a studio that, um, uh, I think they're, they used to be famous for flight sims like Red Baron, uh, stuff like that, but they also made a bunch of other games, um, mostly after Sierra bought them, um, in like 1990 or 91, something like that. Um, they made, uh, like the Incredible Machine, which had a huge impact on gaming. You know, all these clones that came out, and, and there's still games kind of like that today. They made um, Mission Force Cyberstorm. They made a Mech Warrior game. They made Tribes, if you're familiar with that. And they made Betrayal at Krondor in 1993. Um, and then Betrayal in Antara uh, has a, a little bit of a weird history. Um... So, I, I think that what happened was they wanted to make a sequel to uh, Betrayal at Krondor, but at first, it the DOS version on, like, floppy disk did not sell very well, uh, so they sold the rights to the Rift War books back to the author Raymond E. Feist. Uh, if you've never read those, give them a read. They're great. I do love them. Um, highly recommend. And then... When the game was re-released on CD, it actually sold a lot better, but since they'd already sold the rights back, they could not make a sequel. So instead, once Betrayal at Grondor started seeing a lot of praise, uh, they went back to the same engine and the same mechanics and design and decided to make a similar game that really echoed what people liked about Grondor um, in an original world, which is this game. Um, now... <laughs> Ironically, another studio called Seventh Level, if I remember correctly, uh, they announced the actual licensed sequel, Return to Krondor, like the next month after Antara was uh, was announced by Sierra. So, there you go. Um, now, Antara still sold well, I believe. Um, so, I mean, we're still playing it today, obviously. Uh, now, even though Dynamic Studio closed uh, back in like 2001, I think when Sierra restructured under Vivendi, now some of the original members uh, are still around. They founded Garage Games, which you might know for distributing the Torque Engine to indie developers. They had a big impact there on allowing people to make their own games and, and do their own game design. Uh, and Ga Garage Games, which is the studio that they founded um, after Dynamics was closed, um, has changed hands several times, and I think they still exist in some capacity, and they have, like, an educational program uh, or a department that works with, like, colleges and schools to provide game design and computer programming education or something like that. So th they're still doing some cool stuff. They don't really do a lot of game development anymore, but they still do engine development. Um, so, all of that said, uh, Antara has a bit of a bumpy history, and this is my first time with it. Um, I have said, as this stream was coming up, that I missed this game the first time around. Um, I, I almost purchased it. I had a physical copy in my hands, in the box, in the shrink wrap, uh, and then got a different game instead. And I think it was because I was in like an electronics boutique or a Babbage's or something like that, but before GameStop was the only physical game store that, still, that was still around. Um, and I had gone there for another game and I guess just didn't have enough allowance money or savings or whatever it was to, to get to. So I got whatever the other one was, you know, Age of Empires 2 or something, you know, Torrance Passage, I don't know. Um, so I passed on this one, and that means that I know nothing about it other than what I have just told you. So I assume that there's a betrayal at some point. I assume it happens in Antara. Uh, I feel like those are safe suppositions, but they are suppositions. 
drawn from context clues. It's all circumstantial evidence. Uh, couldn't tell you more. Now, I'm hoping that it's going to be a lot like Betrayal at Krondor because I have played that one and I did love it. It was a tough game. It was an unforgiving game. Um, but it had a lot to love. And I know that there's some criticisms out there of Antara that it's a bit more linear, uh, a little bit less open world, or a little less freedom in the plot, perhaps, and, and like in side questing. But we'll find out. Um, it looks like there are three levels of difficulty, or I, I guess nine total, maybe? I'm not sure what's what here. I'm guessing that this is like the base difficulty level, and then there's an easy, normal, and hard version um, of each one, perhaps? Uh, I'm going to set it on beginner, but I'm going to leave it on normal over on this side just because I don't know like what that's going to do. Maybe we can change it later. Um, if I find that the game is too easy, I can, I can switch it to intermediate. Uh, or if we find that the game is too hard, then um, I will ask y'all to pray. So let's go ahead and get started and see what Betrayal in Antara has in store for us. I'm super excited because y'all chose this game. My first blind playthrough on the channel. And you selected it, so I'm, I'm eager to see what happens here. The attack was brutal, without provocation. Acknowledging the futility of their fight, the crew abandoned their ship to a thirsty blaze. The crew and two passengers. Strangers tossed by fate into the same small lifeboat, desperately rowing towards safety. We're gonna make it. And pursued by something out of a nightmare. Ugh. Oh, I thought the face with the eyes was the thing out of a nightmare, but I guess it's that gargoyle-looking thing. A rocky shore near the village of Brial, an apparent borderline came here to fish many a bar for some afternoon's away. Here, Aaron found the peace mm, of quiet to dream the sound of distant is not lands, great. mighty heroes, and exploits far more daring than those told over mugs of ale of the spitting lion. That's yes. a bit bad. Hey! What was that? This very afternoon, the first great adventure of his life was leaping toward him. <gasps> was it the horrible gargoyle thing? One man was sprawled motionless on the beach, while a young noble tried to fend off an enormous flying beast, the likes of which Aaron had never seen. Apparently Aaron was. could see that the man was losing. Drawing his scaling knife, Aaron charged forward. Aaron's yell and sudden appearance startled the beast, but its surprise was only momentary. Get back! He'll kill you too! Aaron ignored the warning. As he bent to support the wounded stranger, the beast swooped upon him. A swipe from its massive foreleg sent Aaron sailing across the sand. Dazed, Aaron looked for an escape from the beast's attack, but there was nowhere to run. Oh, is it gonna throw us straight into battle, maybe? Aaron turned away, shielding his head with his arms as terror overwhelmed him. Terror and something else. Ah! Oh. Well then. What happened? <gasps> Dang. Nearby, the stranger knelt by his dying companion. God. God. Don't talk. We'll get help. But the prone man knew it was too late. With his last strength, he pressed a medallion into the noble's hand. Concert. Hmm. Is this worth a man's life? Pocketing the medallion, the young noble walked to where Aaron stood, still stunned, near a glassy trough in the sand. That was some trick. How? What did I do? For one thing, you probably saved my life. What was that thing? I don't know, but it dropped some kind of firebomb on our ship. We had to take to the lifeboats. It seemed to take a particular interest in Gregor, and I had the bad luck to share a boat with him. That was Gregor? Yes, 
He gave me this before he died. Any idea what it is? If it's a thing of magic, I thought you might recognize it. Me? I'm just a steward and stable hand at my father's inn. Then how do you account for... I, I don't know. Hmm. I've heard that the gift of magic can come on strong without warning. Magic? Me? What's your name? I am Aaron Cordelain of Briala, my lord. Well, Aaron, my name is William Escobar of Panizzo, and I am in your debt. I consider it my duty as the fourth son of the House of Escobar to help you with this... this... latent talent of yours. Uh, that's all right. I really should be getting back to the inn now. Don't be silly. You can return with me to my father's house, and I'll introduce you to our mage. He will teach you to harness and control your magic, before you hurt yourself. As you wish, my lord. Though, if you please, I'd like to go home first to tell my parents. Of course. But stop with this milord business, Aaron. I make it a policy to dispense with such formalities when someone has just saved my life. Okay, so there's our intro. Panizzo it is, then. All set? It's all so much, so fast. I... I think I should talk to my parents first. I'm sorry, I should have thought. Of course. Let's go see them. I'd like to meet them. Thanks. They're not going to believe this. Those paper dolls, though. You can tell that they used a similar base model for both of them and just did some recoloring. Okay, let's see. So, that was a lot to take in. So, Aaron apparently has the gift of magic, which he spontaneously discovered uh, in defending this other guy here. So, let's see. View a character's inventory by clicking on that character's portrait. That's pretty standard. View a character's skills and status by right-clicking that character's portrait. Pop-up help on any other control or object by right-clicking. Okay, makes sense. Raise the control panel by moving the cursor to the bottom of the window or via the P key. Lock the control panel in its raised position by checking the box in the options screen. Okay. There we go. So there's... Yeah, there's a bit of a delay, but... Uh, let's see how open world this is. Okay. So I am steering with the arrow keys. But uh, it looks like... Yeah, you can also use this, and you can work with just the mouse. Ooh, we move quickly. I don't know, William. I never thought I'd be stealing from a dead man. That's no better than what a common cutthroat would do. We're just being practical, Aaron. Look at it this way. Nothing he's carrying can help him anymore, but it might be able to help us. Huh. Okay, well, let's see. Gold. Okay, this does very heavily resemble Betrayal at Krondor. Uh, so let's see. We will click and drag. Okay, and there's our gold over there. Presumably this is what we're searching. And this is... I'm guessing that's rations? Oh, okay. Yeah, we can even right-click here, too. Um, I'm not quite used to that. Like, that's going to... That is different from Betrayal at Krondor by quite a bit. Because, of course, even though... Krondor was re-released on CD-ROM later, um, it still had most of the, you know, the qualities of an old DOS game, uh, and that meant that it didn't really have a great smooth interface in some instances. So let's see. Food rations. William was never sure what he'd find inside these wrapped bundles, but dried fish, smoked meats, and roasted nuts were the most common. Whatever they held, it never spoiled, but it never tasted as good as fresh food either. Amount two. Okay. Now, uh, that was actually something. Um, in Betrayal at Krondor, your characters would get hungry and they would lose stamina and eventually they could get sick if they did not eat or rest often enough. And um, food in your inventory could spoil. So it looks like that's something that they've adjusted here where rations won't spoil, but presumably other kinds of food can. I'm guessing these are lot picks. William admired the polished silver tools. The precision taken in crafting the lockpicks was matched by that required to make a lock give up its secrets. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we can decide when there's a stack of something, like, how much to give the character we're dropping onto. Sen water. 
William held the bottle gingerly, for it's, it contained one of the Triune's greatest gifts to humanity. Only the sisters of Sinadrin knew the location of Denna's fabled spring, but its healing water had saved thousands of lives. Okay, so this is a healing potion, then. Uh, let's see. Okay, well then, let's give him uh, 13 of them, I guess. And we will give Aaron the other 12. Because if he's going to be presumably our spellcaster, uh, then hopefully he won't need as many healing potions because he'll have fewer hit points to recover and shouldn't be in melee combat, shouldn't be getting beaten up. Okay, now, um, if this is, again, like Krondor, then uh, your armor and weapons can degrade over time, and characters actually had skills in Betrayal at Krondor um, where they could, like, repair and maintain their gear, and you needed supplies to do that, like you had to have aventuring in order to maintain bows, and you had to have whetstones to maintain swords and axes and similar. A leather jerkin, lightweight and affordable, the simple leather jerkin and leggings offered a modicum of protection without slowing the wearer down. A common choice for travelers wary of brigands. 69%, damage absorbed 17%, hardness 10 Resistance is none. Blessed, no. Okay, so some of this at least then is familiar. And this is going to be our exit button, I'm guessing. Access the current secondary inventory. Party's food and cash supply. Currently the party has three days worth of food and 86 burlas. Three days worth of food. Okay, so we have six food or six rations. So that means it's going to take... Um, one bit of food per character in the party per day. And I'm guessing this is the exit button. Yes. Okay. Oh. Neat. And this is the, um... This is the scorch mark where Aaron killed the, uh, the monster with his magic. Whoa, we move, like, really fast. Okay, but at least we cannot accidentally enter the water and drown, uh, because, yeah, when I hit it, it automatically turns and forces me to, to go elsewhere, similarly with the cliffs. Okay, huh. Wild. I wonder if I can change the walking speed. Okay, what is this button? Nothing? Okay, so I can turn that on and off. If I'm going to use the keyboard, I suppose I don't need that out, but that way we know where to get it. This is going to be our compass. Okay, and this is for the era, considering this came out in, like, uh, 96, 97, 98, something like that, or a little bit before. This doesn't look too bad. Oh, and now it's nighttime. Uh, it's, I'm, oh, okay. Okay, so let's see, we've got... Camping. Set up camp to rest and heal. Not available on roads or near enemies. Flashbacks. Remember past conversations. Oh, that's a neat feature. Okay, I'm sure we'll use that. Spellcasting. Choose a spell from a spellcaster's repertoire or research a new spell. Hmm. View the overhead or world maps. Previously placed map annotations and the party's position in the world. Quick save. Save the current game to the bookmark file. And contents. Return to the game's main content screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we do want to go ahead and we will save. I'm assuming that's our map. There we go. And of course, in an open world adventure game like this, I would be a fool not to have two save files. I like that it gives you the screenshot, though. Okay, now. Now we can change the uh, options. Okay, here we go. Step size, small. Turn size, small. So that will probably... I'm guessing step size is how much ground we cover whenever I tap one of the arrow keys. So this should slow that down. Control panel lock. We don't want to do that. Ambient sounds, dialogue sound, next page. Automatic map notations. Oh, okay, so it will automatically map chests, inns, taverns, NPCs, sacks, shops, temples. 
Okay, and then auto skill allocation. No. Auto spell research. No, we want manual control over that. Retain auto combat settings. Move in low resolution. Okay. Yeah, that's much more manageable. Okay. So it takes a second after we, um, uh, like after I hit the button, sometimes there's a small delay. You can see as I turn here and then I hit forward, like that's fine. But then when I turn, sometimes there's a little bit of resistance. So you can see those hesitations are not me. Those are from the game. So when I change direction, sometimes it takes the game a moment to think about it. Okay. Well, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. I do love a, temp a tutorial pop-up. Skills and status tips. The outer status bar show the maximum possible value for each skill in the current chapter. Okay, so as the game progresses, we will have different level caps for skills, I guess, and they will be able to get better over time. Um, that was also something in Betrayal at Krontor, not necessarily the skill cap, but um, everyone had access to different skills, and similarly to an Elder Scrolls game, they tended to improve when you used them. So, like, your melee accuracy would get better whenever you hit someone with a melee weapon. Your ranged accuracy, or archery skill, or whatever it's called, would get better when you shot someone with a bow. Um, you know, your, your lock picking would get better when you successfully picked a lock, and so on. Let's see, the inner status bars show the current value for each skill. Okay, and this value is affected by the character's health level. Oh, right, okay, and so that is like Krondor as well. If you are wounded, um, then the effectiveness of your skills goes down. You had uh, two resources, I think, which was like stamina and health, and your health generally did not decrease until your stamina hit zero, except under certain special conditions like particular spells or critical hits from enemies would reduce your health even if you had stamina left. Um, or things like poison would directly affect your health um, and bypass your stamina. Select skills to study them. No more than five skills may be studied at once. Resize wedges in the time pie. <laughs> the time pie. Okay. I love that. Um, so allocate more or less time to the studying of each skill. Allocating more time to a single skill improves that skill faster, but reduces the overall improvement rate. When viewing Aaron's skills, click on the spellcasting skills button on the control panel to view his spellcasting skills. Okay, so it's either telling us um, that Aaron is the only spellcaster we're going to get, and therefore he is the only one for whom that is important and that's a unique function for him, or because this is still very early on in the game and this is like the tutorial part, um, it's using him as an example because that's what we can do right now. Okay, and then this, I can see these colors correspond to what is said over here. So William is currently studying uh, or working on improving melee, defense, lockpicking, haggling, and archery. And it looks like all of them are fairly even. Um, archery and defense may be a bit bigger than maybe melee. And then, or, oh no, that's haggling. Gray is haggling. Yeah, and then defense and lockpicking might be a little bit smaller than these, but I'm not 100% certain because of, of the graphics. Uh, they just might look a little uneven uh, because this is low resolution. Uh, although... Uh, I think I'm trying to remember what little bit of research that I did about the games. Like Betrayal at Krondor, of course, used VGA graphics because it was a DOS native program. Um, Betrayal in Antara actually runs native in Windows like 3.1 and Windows 95, um, so it used SVGA graphics. Which I mean, that's still old school. You know, it's not the same thing as 1080p or what have you, but but nonetheless. Okay, so his other skills, he's got Assessment, Repair, Stealth, Scouting, and Gambling, and Foraging. 52 Health, 45 Stamina, 5 Range, 24 Strength. 
Okay, archery 20%, 20%. Okay, see, yeah, they are all even, even though to me the blue and yellow wedges look distinctly smaller than the other three. But it's nice that, uh, okay, and equalize. So we have a button in the center that will automatically divide time. Nice. Okay, so regardless of what we choose, if we just punch that, it will distribute them for us. Whoa. Okay. Hmm. Okay, that is very awkward. Because you can you can kind of see like when I grab one of the wedges, right? It jumps my mouse cursor over here to the uh, to the upper left corner. So that is like super awkward. So I'm glad we have that button uh, because it looks like it would take a lot of work to have him super specialize in something. Uh, but that's all right. We'll leave it as it is for now because we don't know a lot about William or Aaron or about the game itself, which means that this may be the optimal setup. We'll find out. So let's find out what these skills do. Melee, obviously, offensive hand weapon ability affects the character's chance of hitting an opponent in combat. Okay, so it does not say anything um, about damage. Presumably that's going to be based on weapon and strength, I guess. Strength 24 of 24, so that's something that can go down. I wonder if that's like carrying capacity, maybe, or something else. Or it might be a stat where, like, a, like an encumbrance stat. If you equip heavy armor or you use a shield, it might require strength versus carrying something in your backpack doesn't. I can't remember if that was a feature of Betrayal at Krondor, but I feel like it's a little familiar, so that could be where I'm getting that idea. Okay, so current value 20 of 20, maximum value is 40, and one-fifth of our time is devoted to that. All right, defense. It's defensive dodging and blocking ability affects a character's chance of avoiding being hit in combat. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's a little bit of an awkward wording. They could have just said affects a character's chance of evading damage in combat or of evading enemy hits. Uh, but I get it. Okay, current value is 18. Max value, again, is 40. Assessment. Ooh, ability to size up an opponent affects a character's chance of determining an enemy's stats, conditions, and or weaknesses in combat. Hmm. Value is 15. Maximum value, 40. Interesting. Okay, so you can identify enemies, and I'm guessing that's what lets you see their stat blocks. Repair. Equipment maintenance skill affects how well a character can repair worn or damaged armor and weapons. Value is 32 out of 40, so he's almost got that maxed out for this chapter. Okay, and this is what they're talking about, like, right here is where they are, and then when this bar fills all the way, then that is the maximum that they can achieve in the current section of the game. Haggling, negotiating skill, of course, affects a character's chance of getting a better price when buying or selling goods. Says at 11 of 40. Stealth, the ability to move silently and hide in shadows, affects a character's chance of surprising opponents. Okay, so getting ambushes for combat, I guess. Scouting, presumably that's the opposite. Wariness, alertness, and tracking affects a character's chance to detect and avoid ambushes and trapped chests. Okay, so it is... Uh, it is the opposite of the stealth skill, and presumably counters that for enemies, but also it seems to incorporate kind of like the perception skill from Might and Magic 6 and 7, um, which, of course, Might and Magic 7 is the last series that I just finished on my Saturday streams. Um, if you have not watched either that one or Might and Magic 6, which was my first series on the channel, uh, you can go back and check those out on my YouTube channel, which is... Uh, you know, all of my social media is linked, my Twitter, my Facebook, my pillow fort, all of that stuff um, down below, and, and it's linked back here as well. So go check that out, and you can see what I mean. Perception is the skill that allows characters to, um, to notice things, uh, much like scouting is here, but also to do stuff like dodge damage from traps. So if a, if a chest blows up in your face, you might duck. Gambling. Understanding of probability, ability to bluff, affects a character's chance of winning when gambling. He's at 33 out of 40. That is his best skill. And the only thing anywhere comparable is repair. 
So he's he's really good at both of those. Interesting. Hmm. I kind of feel like because since we only have two characters, he's probably going to be our melee guy for right now. And Aaron presumably is going to be casting spells, which means that it might benefit us to take archery off of focus. And maybe we should put it in gambling or repair because those are close to maximum. So we could put it on, like, say, gambling um, to level that up and try to see if we can get it to the maximum value of 40 before the end of this first chapter. And then when it does hit maximum, we can switch that over to repair. Uh, and, and then so on down the line. And then he can go on to foraging or something else. Lockpicking affects a character's chance of successfully disarming traps and using lockpicks to open locked chests, of course. That's only 12, but we definitely want that. We know, again, from Might and Magic, but also from Icewind Dale and you know any other game where there are traps that need to be disarmed especially, but also locks that need to be picked, that's a critical skill. You've got to have somebody good at that, so we'll leave that one. Foraging. Ability to fish rivers and extract precious minerals from the earth? 25 of 40, huh? So there's fishing and mining in this game. Wasn't expecting that. And then archery, I'm presuming, is the same thing as melee, but for bows. Yeah, ability with a bow affects a character's chance of hitting the intended target at range in combat. Spellcasters do not have this skill. Okay, so by virtue of being a mage, presumably, Aaron doesn't even get archery. He will probably have the mage equivalent of that, like spell accuracy or something instead. Click here to go to the spell skills interface. Okay, and it's not lit up. It's grayed out because he doesn't have that. Okay, well, skills have been modified. Save these changes. No, let's see. We'll come back to that. Inventory tips. Oh, because I left clicked instead of right clicking. Okay, so you can. So if you right click to open the status and skill menu and then you left click on the same portrait or another portrait, it jumps from status and skills to inventory. So if I want to go from William's skill screen to Aaron's skill screen, I have to right click on Aaron, not left click, because I just went to Aaron's inventory. Okay, hmm. That'll take a little getting used to, but no problem. Examine an item by right-clicking on it. Okay, we got that. Equip items by dragging them onto the mannequin. It's going to be our paper doll over here. Unequip items by dragging them from the mannequin. Note that armor, swords, and staves cannot be unequipped in this way, but are unequipped automatically if another item of the same type is equipped. Okay, so that means that it's going to force them to use the best weapons and armor that they have, or I guess a better way to say that is, like, the game does not account for characters not having armor or weapons of some kind. So, like, there's no sense in them not using it. So if they have armor, they're going to keep it on, and you cannot remove it unless you are exchanging it with new armor. Hmm. Okay. I uh, wonder how that'll affect the repair skill. I guess you just have to click directly on it. Transfer an item to another character by dragging it onto the receiving character's portrait. Got it. View the party's food and gold by clicking on the food and gold indicator. Okay, so that, um, I guess, is going to be held in common. Then they're going to have a kitty for the gold, and then all the food is just shared. Because uh, when I dragged the, the rations down onto William, I assumed from my experience with Betrayal at Crondor that they would just go into his inventory, and you actually had to keep separate rations in each person's backpack individually. Use an item by clicking on it and then clicking the Use button, or by double-clicking, and use items on each other by dragging one item onto another. Hmm. Okay, so that means, uh, similarly, like if you have to repair something, you're going to drag a whetstone onto the sword, I guess. Okay, so let's see. Herbal powder. Oh, okay. And because you see the blue highlight down here behind their portrait, that indicates the currently selected character. So I was wondering if it was narrating using William because he's just assumed to be our protagonist, um, which I thought was kind of odd because it seemed to be implying that Aaron was kind of the guy who showed up on the scene and was doing stuff, you know, was like the important one. Um but I guess it was because I was I had William selected, and that's why when we were investigating things on the dead guy's, uh, Gregor's body, that it was using his name 
to like for who was doing the examining and so forth. Okay, so Aaron opened the bag and peered inside, recoiling at the horrid stench. Applied to a wound, the crushed herbs and ground roots would accelerate the natural healing process. Aaron just prayed he never injured his nose. Four of those, okay. And then yeah, okay, so this is the this is the sen water we gave him. So I'm guessing this is like probably better healing and is instantaneous, but is maybe harder to get hold of or something like that. Um, or this might be for, like, one is for stamina and one is for health. So it might be that the herbal powder is actually more precious and the sun water might just be your stamina recovery potion. And I'm guessing this is a fishing rod. Hardly much more than a polished stick with a gut line attached to one end. The pole was obviously intended for small fish. Aaron wouldn't catch any trophies with it, but then he intended to eat what he caught, not mount it. Okay. It doesn't look like he has any armor. Can I examine the staff? Yes, wooden staff. Stout length of wood seemed better suited to a walking staff than a weapon, but what it lacked in balance, it made up for in weight. Okay, and this also... Um is from Betrayal at Crondor. I'm, I mean, it was built to be a, a replacement sequel, a spiritual successor, if you will, for Crondor. So I, I have to stop saying that because everything in here is going to be a lot like Betrayal at Crondor. Um, but this is one of the options. When you go to attack someone with melee weapons, you can choose to thrust, to swing, or to hack. And each of those... Um, deals a slightly different kind of damage based on the weapon and may have different accuracy amounts as you can see here so like um swinging is the most accurate attack that he has uh but thrust swing and hack damage are all the same for this weapon so that means that if he wants to hit anybody with this staff we should probably be swinging it most of the time otherwise he's more likely to miss okay Okay, good, and it shows over here. Okay, so that's why it just says wooden staff up there, and we can right-click the words wooden staff as well as right-clicking on the actual item itself. So yeah, he's wearing a leather jerkin, which is at 100%, nice. And he's carrying a short sword. The simple sword was little different from the thousands like it in Antara. Easy to wield and equally suited for thrusts and slashes, it was the most commonplace weapon in the Empire. I wish that that was in present tense. I don't know why the description is in past tense, I guess for narrative purposes, but it's not the decision I would have made. Hardness 10, which is the hardness stat for weapons and armor, indicates um, how quickly its condition decays when it is used. So whenever armor is, whenever you get hit, your armor's condition is going to be reduced. Whenever you hit someone else, your weapon is going to... to decay over time hardness determines how quickly that happens so basically how much damage they take so thrust accuracy is five swing accuracy of 10 hack accuracy five now it just said equally suited for thrusts and slashes but then it's got the same stats basically as the staff um, except that it's hack damage is only five instead of 10 so once again we're probably going to be swinging with this weapon Okay, so we will give this to Aaron. Okay, and it's self-rearranging. Good. This is the shepherd medallion that he got from Gregor. William studied the bronze medallion. The face was cast with an image of a rolling pasture. A cloaked shepherd watched a flock of sheep, his crook held loosely at his side. Flipping it over, he found the back of the disc to be bare, except for a triangular indentation in the center and the letters RLR hastily scratched into the bronze. Okay, this is the secondary inventory. Okay, so this is like, um, it was the body before when we were examining Gregor, so we could have moved things onto the body from these inventory screens. So now it's a sack because we can just put something on the ground. And then, yeah, two days worth of food because since night fell, even though we haven't camped, presumably they ate those rations. And I do not see the rations in... Uh, William's inventory so yes whenever we pick up food it is going to go into a common inventory ok 
Okay, there we go. Leather Jerkin for Aaron. That'll help a little bit. It's only at 69% uh, condition. Nice. But uh, we'll fix that. We'll, once we get some supplies, maybe William can repair it. And you can see, yeah, he can't. I can drag it, uh, but I can't let it go into the inventory. It just automatically equips back onto him. Damage absorbed 25% versus this one is 17, as we saw earlier. So as the condition decays, armor also becomes less effective. And presumably that's going to be the case with weapons as well. And here is our food and gold. So by clicking on this lower portion of the screen over here, we can see all of our money and we can see all of our, um, uh, our food. What is this? Click here to use the selected inventory item in the world. Okay, so that's where like we would click this and then that lights up. Okay. All right, cool. Can I deselect? Do I need to? Okay, so the escape button just takes you back out. Uh, all right, well, let's check these skills then. We're going to take archery off. I'm going to put that on... There's only one point difference, but I don't know how fast uh, skills will increase. But I am still going to... Oh, okay, are each of these... Oh, okay, so each of these has their own color to help indicate where they are um, over here on the wheel. Okay, I thought it was just going to be like, you know, number one selected skill is orange, number two is blue, and so on, but no. Okay, so there we go. Um, I'm going to set him to repair first because if this is anything like Betrayal at Crondor, which could be unforgiving, um, and things like money gain could be kind of slow, then I want repair to go up as soon as possible and to keep that maxed out at all times. Gambling can be important, but I think it's going to be less important than repair, so we'll set him to that. And now let's check out Aaron's skills. Okay, so he's got spell casting and spell accuracy. Everything else looks like it's pretty much the same. Uh, okay, so he's not nearly as good at gambling, although it's still a decent skill for him. His repair skill's okay. Lock picking, 15. Is he actually... Oops, got to remember to right click. Huh, he actually is better at lock picking than William is. But I can see... Okay, I, I kind of see the dynamic here. Like, because he's our spellcaster, we're going to need spellcasting and spell accuracy marked over here at all times to keep that maxed out. So it's going to be more difficult to spread out his learning and have him max skills such as lock picking. So even though he's got three ranks up on William, William is probably going to be our lock picker. Scouting 11, stealth 12, haggling is better than William, so we'll have to remember that too. Um, on the one hand, that means that's going to get us a better deal in shops, but on the other hand, I don't know if skills can increase through use if they are not selected over here on the wheel. And then, of course, he's got melee, defense, and assessment. Uh, okay, so spellcasting is going to cost stamina. I don't want to slack on his melee, but that's also not what he should be doing most of the time. Defense, definitely he should have. Assessment, I like. I feel like I'm going to take melee off. And I'm going to put it over here on Foraging because he's got 38. So he only needs two ranks to reach the maximum of 40 for this uh, this chapter. So once he does hit 40, then we can take that off and we can put it back on uh, Scouting or Stealth or something. Or maybe even Melee and, and we'll see. Uh, and if you guys have an opinion, of course, drop that in the chat. Once we see how this game is going to work... Um, if you want to work on certain skills with certain characters, or if you want me to build the party in a certain way, I'm absolutely open to your suggestions. So, okay, let's see. He's got significantly less health. Okay, that did save. Okay, so we got 52, 45, 24, and, oops, and range 5 as well. 52, 45, 5, 24, 32, 48, 4, 13. So William is the stronger one. He's got better range. I'm guessing that maybe is their movement, not actually how far away they can hit. 
because even though he had the archery skill marked, we don't have a bow. All he has is a short sword. So I'm guessing that's their movement. He actually has better stamina probably because he is a spellcaster. But of course, William has more health. But then he's got almost twice as much strength, so... Alright, spellcasting, ability to, manip uh, to manipulate magical energy, affects a character's rate of magical development and accuracy with ranged spells. Only spellcasters have this skill. The amount of time allocated to the skill is further allocated amongst different spell skills. Okay, that's what that second button means. The value of this skill is the average value of all spellcasting skills. Okay, so if it is an average, then that means that as these other spellcasting skills go up, um, this number will always increase like the same rate, no matter how you allocate this. So if he's got, if this is divided into like fire magic, healing magic, uh, wind magic, and you know whatever, then even if we put all of our eggs in one basket, um, because it's an average, this will still go up at the same rate. So that's useful. So we, we want to keep this focused in, because that is going to determine how we allocate amongst these skills, presumably. So we still want this to go up as much as possible, as fast as possible. But now it says here, Affects a character's rate of magical development and accuracy with ranged spells. Well, then why do we have a separate skill called Spell Accuracy? Ability to direct magical energy with precision affects a character's chance of hitting his intended target with ranged spells. Only spellcasters have this skill instead of archery. Instead of archery, what? So I guess maybe the accuracy is determined by like a combination of both of them, perhaps? Or maybe one of them is hitting and the other is, like, affecting. Yeah, like, maybe this one is, is like, kind of like your attack roll. And this one is, like, the saving throw sort of thing. So this, this is whether your firebolt hits the guy. And this one is whether or not he actually takes damage from the firebolt or, or dodges it or something. Um, I'm going to assume that's what it is. Okay, so... Interesting. What have we got here? So a whole this is a whole separate screen with whole other buttons. Okay, click here to go to the spellcasting interface. We'll check that out in a minute. Click here to go to the mundane skills interface. Click here to go to the spell creation interface. What? Okay, spell being researched. Static discharge. Progress percentage 45%. Okay, so it looks like maybe he doesn't know a spell yet, but we've got three different areas of spell casting or, or types of magic unlocked. And so um, our time is developed evenly or, or is distributed evenly, 33%, 34% for touch, I guess, and then uh, between all three of these. So touch, affect a target by physical contact. Electricity is lightning and electricity, of course, okay, and create, spontaneously generate a substance or effect. So these are both at 5 and that's at 10. So I guess that's what he did to that gargoyle creature, is he blasted it with a giant lightning bolt. Alright, spell being researched, static discharge, and he's at 45%. So it kind of makes sense, and that's probably also why he had melee as a skill focus as well is because he might not actually have a spell yet he may be researching his first spell and that's what he cast accidentally a moment ago and now he's like deliberately working on learning how to control it uh let's see here spell casting tips change spell groups by uh, clicking on a wedge in the disc at left Select a spell by clicking on an icon at right. Power a spell by clicking on the active gems surrounding the disc or the arrows below the disc. Some combat spells require a target. Click on the target ally, enemy, or grid space to finish casting such spells. Okay, so once again, um, this is kind of like Betrayal at Crondor where uh, effectively what this is is a, a manual magic meter. Um, if this works the same way, then in Crondor you could decide how much oomph to throw behind a spell. 
Uh, and sometimes that made a big difference, especially if you missed. So, like, if you had a, a, a to use the same analogy from before, if you had a firebolt, um, the more stamina you spent on it, obviously losing that stamina was going to hurt you because then you couldn't take as many punches in combat. And once you ran out of stamina during a battle, you would have to use health to keep casting your spells. Um, which is a big deal because then remember that as your health decreases, everything else that you do gets worse, including your spell casting, because all of your skills um, decrease as your health goes, you know, to a percentage below 100%, below maximum. Um, but by spending that extra stamina, if that firebolt hit a guy, you know, you might one shot him if you threw enough stamina behind it. And it looks like. Yeah, we just don't have any spells that I can select or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I guess he, he doesn't have any magic until he researches Static Discharge. Now what's this? Whoa. Okay, that was very sudden. Uh, let's see here. Spell creation tips. Spells are learned through research and the combination of component to spellcasting skills. Select skills to combine them. Skills which cannot currently be combined with all selected skills become disabled. Later in the game, as your knowledge increases, new combinations may become possible. When all selected skills form a spell, that spell's name appears on the pedestal. Hmm. As time passes in the game, spell research progresses, and the globe rises toward the top of the screen. When it reaches the top, the spell has been learned and is now available to cast via the spellcasting screen. To learn spells faster, use the time pie in the skills screen to allocate more time to the spellcasting skill. Okay, so that is a very annoying sound effect. But so what we've got here is... Okay, so whether this is active or not, determines okay all right so okay so each of these makes a different uniquely annoying noise um and what that sound was is all of them being activated because if you turn them on individually they make their specific sound and then when you pile them all on then they they come together with a specific tone Okay, so it shows if, if this is animated, then that means that skill or that school of magic, I guess, um, is uh, currently being used to research. And then over here, you could see when all of them are active, it says static discharge to show that he is researching it. So if we take something off... Yeah, so right now, all three of these must be active because that's the only spell that he can research it looks like um so this is going to be like that system is going to be one of those neat games where basically we're going to uh click to combine different types of magic until we discover potential spells and then once we have figured out the combination we can research that spell until we know it and then find a new one uh, makes me think of Revenant, where you would get the spell medallions and you would have to combine them in different sets of two. Uh, so there were all kinds of spells that you had to figure out by um, attempting to light up two or three of, of the medallions or however. I said two, it might have been. I think you could combine up to three. Um, and then attempting to cast the combination. And if it worked, then you would learn a new spell. So, okay. Well, um, I think that is all of the menu screen stuff. So let's check down here. This is flashbacks, right? Spell casting, quick save. And this is the map. That's what I want to check, uh, check out now. Overhead map tips. The arrow indicates the location and facing of your party. Navigate using the arrow keys on your keyboard. Okay, so we can drive from here, too. All right. That's something that I like. Um, place notes on the map by dragging colored seals from the draw, uh, drawer. I almost said drawer. At right. View notes by right-clicking on seals already on the map. Erase notes by dragging the seal to the knife in the drawer. Or vice versa. Okay, so it's like scrape up a seal. It's Okay, it's treating it like an actual wax seal that you put down as a POI, and you scrape it up with a knife. That's neat. 
I like the aesthetic of that. That's a cool gimmick. Switch to the world map by clicking on the globe in the drawer. Okay, so just like the bottom... Yeah, just like the, the bottom uh, bar, we just kind of have to like hover over it and it'll pop out. Okay, and it looks like day-night cycles affect the overhead map as well, which may be a good thing or maybe a bad thing. We can zoom in and out. There is our party. Okay, and that's it might be a little difficult to see um, because sometimes these old retro graphics get a little blurry when you blow them up into like 1080p, but that's like the fletching on the butt end of the arrow, and then that's the arrow head, so we're pointing to the southwest. Okay, and then we click this to go back. Oh, no way, this is the world map. The arrow indicates the uh, location and facing of your party again. Lines on the map indicate roads. To view annotations on the map, click on annotation types in the drawer at the right. Switch the overhead map by clicking on the map in the drawer. Okay, and it switches so that we can go back to this. Okay. Go to Panizzo. So we are here. And it looks like we need to head to... Okay, that's, that's Aaron's village. That's where he said he came from was Briala. And then from Briala, presumably, we will gain access to uh, larger amounts of the world map, and we will be given a, uh, a direction to go. Oh, there's Antara with a star, so I'm assuming that's the capital of, of this area. Um, they made it sound earlier like Antara was the whole land, so that may be, it may be named after its capital city, or that may be why the capital's called that. Okay. All right, well, uh, okay, I, we've done enough learning, I guess. Let's, uh, let's do a little looking. Okay, good, there's some, there's some daytime, I like that. Party is getting tired and should rest soon. Oh, really? Okay. Well. Because we were up all night, I guess. I wonder how quickly time passes in this game. That could be a problem. Resting heals the party. Poisoned, starving, or incapacitated characters do not heal normally. Poisoned characters need time, sen water, fidali paste, or a sister of Sanadrin to cure them. The black shadow on the sundial shows the current time. The red shadow shows the time it will be when the party stops resting. Change the number of hours to rest by clicking on gems surrounding the sundial or the arrows beside the numeric display. If characters have whetstones or hammers, checking the auto repair button uses them to repair swords or armor before sleeping. At 6 p.m., each character consumes one day's worth of food. If no food is available, characters begin starving. Okay, so that means that uh, we need to find our way to Briala. Um, like pretty quickly because we only have a couple days worth of food so I'm I am sure since Aaron just kind of ran over here that like it's not going to take us two days to get there uh, but that means that we need to like keep an eye out here and this is showing a combination of their health and their stamina so that's why it's 97 and 80 so I guess uh, if they only need five hours okay so Y'all good? Alright, let's begin exploring. I love this open world that they've got going on here. Now I wonder if we will see, like, monsters and things. Oh! I guess so. If that other screen flashed by pretty quick, um... <laughs> if you're watching this on the YouTube upload, you can go back and um, pause on that frame if you can catch it to see what it says, because I'm going to be doing that in post. Um, let's see. So I guess this is a random encounter. Spaces within a character's range highlight when the cursor moves over them. Okay, so that is their movement. Move by clicking on a highlighted empty space. Attack by clicking on a highlighted enemy space. Change attack types by the lower left control panel button right here. 
Assess an enemy by right-clicking on that enemy's space. Toggle display of the combat grid with the G key. Okay. Well, we definitely want to be able to see the grid. Okay, so this is a hex grid. Uh, this is a very similar sort of, like, uh, weird, um, like, hex-based combat, sort of 3D hex combat that Krondor had. The graphics here look uh, a little bit cleaner, but also slightly more cartoonish. Um, Krondor... I don't think that it, I don't know if it used rotoscoping, but they definitely did use, like, real people in costume um, to, to take pictures and put their faces and, and bodies into the game. And also, they think they did that for, like, environments and items and things as well, or at least some of them. Um, and I believe Antara did that too. Like, you can tell this was obviously pixel art. And so does this also appears to be, but like the environments, I think that they actually took pictures and then treated them in an art program in order to make them look more like a painting. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so it will not highlight outside of where he can move. So one, two, three, four. Yeah, so four is his combat speed. Um, spell casting. He doesn't have anything, of course. Oh, wait. Protection spell. Okay, here we go. This is a little bit more... Um, cause I, okay, so we didn't have these options um, in the other screen because we weren't in combat, so that blue flame th sort of icon that we saw, I guess, is like maybe only spells that can be cast outside of battle. And then these are your combat spells. So this is going to be protection... Close range, area effect spells with the hex grid, okay. Line of sight spells, and miscellaneous. Okay, and this is going to be defend, focus entirely on blocking enemy attacks. Auto combat, set which PCs are controlled by the player, which are controlled by the computer. Current attack mode swing, normal damage and accuracy, and you can cycle through possible melee attack modes. Right, so we can see here, like, damage 23, accuracy 74, minus enemy defense. If we switch to hack, it drops to 54, 81, and also the damage is, um, uh, is lower. So that's kind of... Swing is like your middling thing. See, 23 damage, 74% chance to hit. Hack is a lot less accurate but deals more damage, so it's like your power attack. And then Thrust is the most accurate, but deals the least damage. So Thrust is kind of like your, it's your old reliable. And then let's see, Rest to regain stamina. Okay, so you can spend a turn in combat to recover or retreat. Okay, well, let's see. Um, that thing's probably got to move in order to hit either of us, so he can't determine anything with assessment yet. So let's see, I'm gonna defend with Aaron. That makes it William's turn. And he doesn't have spell casting, of course he's got a bow, so, or well he doesn't, but he has the archery skill. Let's defend again. Okay, so it looks like it moved but didn't attack. Okay, here we go. He's able to assess the following. A Carleth with defense 20. So let's move. Okay, so if we move and don't click on a creature to attack it, those are not two separate actions. So I think I lost that turn. Like, I could have attacked it because it was within one, two, three, four. Uh, but I just clicked to move rather than clicking on it to attack. So, so we'll try that again. Let's see. Swing... 34 damage or 80% accuracy. Hack, 36 and 59. Thrust is 26, but 89. Okay, so we'll split the difference. We'll go with swing then. A miss. A swing and a miss. Ah, and the Carleth attacks Aaron. This is very familiar because um, one of your main characters, or arguably maybe even your main character, your, your protagonist, roughly, for most of the game in Betrayal at Krondor, is a, uh, a young, rural, waif-like mage with a staff, um, kind of dun-colored clothing and longish blonde hair, 
named Owen. So Aaron and Owen, like, like this is very similar. This is very close. Okay, and let's try a thrust here. 19 damage. Not bad. William is able to assess the following speed 4, okay. 34 damage, dang. Oh, he is out of there. Okay, so now we can chase it, and let's see if I just click on it, because we've got 1, 2, 3, 4. Will he move and hit? Yes. Okay, so that is how that happens. There we go. Okay, the battle was won. The adrenaline rush quickly wore off, leaving William feeling more drained than exhilarated. The thrill of combat made him feel alive, but in the aftermath, he wondered how close he'd come to death. Okay, I thought I saw something moving up ahead of us, so that was the Carlith. There you can see a little bit more of what it looks like. Some kind of giant lizard, I guess? And it appears to have nothing on it. Let me... I'm trying to look a little bit ahead and see whether or not, like, if I can predict fights or um, if any of these are, like, plants that we can use, for example. Because some of these appear to have different, um, you know, different appearances. Okay, there's the beach where we were. Now this went around and came out to, like, a cliff or a dead end. Yeah, because I could see it from the end of the beach down there, so doesn't look like there's anything here. Okay, well, um, oh, see, it's nighttime already. Time passes pretty quickly. Party is getting tired and should rest soon. Well, not available on roads or near enemies. Oh, okay, we have to leave the, the actual physical road. Okay, well... Hmm. All right. Uh, let's follow the road because if time's gonna pass that quickly, um, then we need to get to Briala. Yeah. See, look, it's already daytime again. Um, because we're gonna run out of food. But thankfully, Briala is right there. Okay, and it does have map memory, so it looks like two. Okay, so we do have a pretty good overhead map when it's not in a night cycle. Like, you can see details, so that shows us that's where we started. And then there is the road through the cliff, and then that goes up to that other town, I'm guessing, towards uh, Bakriel. Eventually, it looks like a long trip. But it doesn't seem as though we stay centered on the map. It looks like it moves with us in sectors. So I'm guessing that we can move all around here and this indicator will show us wherever we're at and then when we get to the end of this and go to a new zone, it's going to jump us back over here and load the new sector. Let's see if I'm right. I heard a sound change. Yep, okay. And this must be Briala. Excellent, good, because we don't want to starve to death, so... Let's just head straight for this pretty blue flower. I'm already getting distracted. Looks like an elvish toadstool from Might and Magic 7. Briala. Love it. Love those graphics. Okay, and I think I see people. Can I right-click on them from here? Nope. Okay, so we have to go up to them to talk to them. We'll have to find some food somewhere because uh, we have only got enough food for one more day. So it took us two days worth of food to get from the beach over here. So, and yeah, 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 it is kind of a, an interesting way to do the mapping. Sorry, I just saw your comment. I was, I was paying attention to our food supply. Um, so yeah, because it looks like we've got a pretty sizable map. Now, we've already crossed, like, this right here looks like it was one square or one sector. Um, and now we are in this sector. So if this is one and this is two, so looks like we are probably looking at two, so four, six, 
8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Man, so what would that be like? That some of this area we're not going to be able to to enter, I'm sure. Like some of these deep mountain areas and some of the ocean. Um, so I am guessing that we're looking at over a hundred map sectors. That's a lot of exploration, you guys. Okay, well. Oh, that's a pretty well-rendered paper doll. Like, I mean, he just... He's two-dimensional, but... Huh. Yeah, yeah, no, we don't want to be casting Immolate in town. Aaron, you're back early. No bites, eh, lad? I wouldn't exactly say that, Dad. Okay. So... These uh, these cutouts are are wild, but this already, even though Betrayal at Crondor did have some voice lines in it, um, I was not expecting this much voice acting already from Betrayal and Antara, so like that's pretty cool. And it's not bad quality voice acting either. Talk to an NPC by clicking on a topic from the list at right. White topics have new information, yellow topics have already been discussed. Okay, to give or show an item to an NPC, click on the portrait of the character carrying the item, drag the item onto the NPC portrait in the inventory screen's control panel. Okay, since goodbye is way down here, and this guy's name probably is not William, I'm guessing that this is our conversation topic. Dad, this is William, youngest son of the House Escobar. Well, 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 this is an honor squire. We don't get highborn folk around here often. A pleasure to meet you, Master Coeur d'Alene. Oh, okay, for just a second I, I saw that, and <laughs> because this is yellow, so no new information, of course, and this just says attack. And I had, like, return to Zork flashbacks for a moment. <laughs> it's like, are we just gonna, are we just gonna lay into his dad? Also, I know I just said the voice acting is not bad, and it's not, but, like, why does his father have that accent, and then Aaron just has, like, a completely different dialect or, or accent? You'll never believe what just happened, Dad. I was fishing on the rocks, same spot as always, and I heard a terrible noise coming from the beach. I ran down and saw a giant flying thing attacking two men. A traca attacked them? A no, what? not a traca, a monster. I ran to help. It swatted me like a gone gnat. But I got its attention because it turned away from William and went after me. Okay, and so as new topics are added, it looks like they're just put on the list in alphabetical order. I thought it was going to kill me for sure. I covered my face and braced for the attack, but it didn't hit me. All of a sudden, I, I felt kind of tingly and warm. I heard the thing shrieking. That made me look up. Yeah. Dad, I killed it. Destroyed it. But I don't know how. William says I blasted it with magic. <laughs> That's not bad, son. Jazz it up a little and you might get a coin or two from the supper crowd. <laughs> no. No, for real, Dad. Like, you can go look at the beach. There's still a giant scorch mark. But yeah, I mean, this is much better than, like, OG Resident Evil. I hope this is not... Chris's blood. You were almost a Jill sandwich. I'm not making it up. It really happened. Master Cordelain, every word Aaron has said is true. Had he not come to my aid when he did, surely I would be dead. Look to our clothes and wounds for proof. Well, I'll be a Ghanish swineherd. Once word of this gets around, folks will be pecked in the lion like field worms in a thunderstorm. This is the most excitement we've had around here since Lonzo's cow birthed twin calves last year. That's, man, okay, well, you talk about a slow news day. The thing of it is, Dad, if I really can do magic, William thinks I should come with him, back to Panizzo. Panizzo? That's halfway across the world, lad. Master Coeur if Aaron doesn't learn to use his magic properly, he could well be a danger to himself and everyone around him. But your mother, and Laura Miller, think of how they'll feel if you just open left. Hannah, think of how I'll feel. You know I depend on you to keep things straight around this place. Why, 
Who would tally up the books and make sure the butcher and tallowman get paid? Who's going to tell me when the serving wenches are planning to elope with the dairyman? <laughs> no, Aaron, I'm sorry, but you're needed here at home. Oh, I know how it is when you reach that age where the town starts feeling two sizes too small. <laughs> I'll not be having you think that your old man doesn't remember what it's like to be young. If you want to plan a trip to Imatsi when we're not in our busy season, maybe even as a honeymoon if you like. Dad, this is my chance. I need to go with William. I've never been to a big town before. Think of the stories, the people, the adventures. <sighs> the fact that I'll you die if I don't. a dreamer, boy. Always looking up at the sky instead of down at the road in front of you. I'll recommend him to my father. Aaron will study with the best mage and tutor in Panizzo. At least wait until your mother gets back from the marketplace. She'll kill me if I let you leave without saying goodbye. Can't, Dad. The governor is expecting William home. Okay, so this is a lot. <laughs> this is... In, in just a few frames here, they have... Um... Like... His dad doesn't seem to have gotten the message that uh, he might blow himself up and set the town on fire if he doesn't get, like, actual wizard school training. Um, they have tried to shoehorn in a straight romance that I do not care about. Uh, and they have also just deus ex machinated their way completely out of, like, even fooling with his mother at all. I mean... I get that you're in a hurry, but you can probably take a couple days or a week to get ready. I mean, for game purposes, that would be a bad idea, like for, for our enjoyment. Um, but I mean, you could fix that with a cutscene or a montage or something, or, or a few lines of written dialogue in, in some of these transitional things. Um, like, come on. Okay, and, and now... So that's it. Goodbye is the only thing left, so... Freaking Don't bye, worry Dad. about Aaron, Master Coeur d'Alene. He can come home to visit soon, and you're always welcome at our estate. Can't say as I hold with this gallivanting off when there's work to be done at home. But I guess you're old enough now to decide for yourself. Take care, Aaron. And remember, there's more to life than a joyman's tale. I will, Dad. Say goodbye to Mama for me. Tell her I love her, and I'll write when I get to Panizzo. Man, just... F's in chat for Aaron's mom, I guess. Just, he's just, just straight up gone. He's just leaving. Forget her. Okay, so let's see. The Spitting Lion Inn, named because of its uh, fountain thing. Okay, so now this is an interface I kind of recognize. Um, less for individual buildings and more for, like, towns as a whole. But in Re Betrayal at Krondor, uh, whenever you visited new places, they would often have scenes like this where you could click on people to speak with them, or you could click on different parts of the map to interact with it, and there might even be things like hidden treasures, um, which you could usually only find once. So like, for example, here you can see when I move down, it turns into a little hand, because presumably something in this very small area right here is available to, to be grabbed. Put something in there then. Let's see if there's anything else. Okay, it looks like maybe she's the only one we can speak to. Yeah, I'm, I'm clicking on these other folks. I like that there's a little bit of animation back there in the back. See? This is very, um, puts me in the mind of like Heroes of Might and Magic 1 and 2 of qualities of animation, perhaps. Let's talk to this chick. Would you like to shop or rest? Okay, drag an item from the store inventory to a character portrait to buy it. Drag an item from a character inventory to the store portrait to sell it. Okay, so we've got ale, rations, roast chicken, and cheese. Uh... William struggled with the stopper jammed tightly into the mouth of the jug. With a sudden jerk, it came free, sloshing a dark, malty ale onto his hand. Hey, if you break it, you buy it. Aged in the damp, cold caverns of the Asprezen Coast. Asprezen Coast? Asprezon? Aspirin. This semi-soft cheese had a sharp bite cherished throughout the empire. 
transport and sweltering caravan wagon beds only seem to deepen its heady flavor. Hmm. Roast chicken. Just thinking about the roasted chicken made his mouth water. William could see the herbs and spices clinging to its skin and sniffed it appreciatively, savoring the aroma of basil, pepper, and parsley. Rosemary and thyme. Okay, so we have 89 burlas. Um, now, you could get drunk, and that was like a status effect in Betrayal at Krondor. Uh, and I just don't know that we need any ale right now. Uh, the cheese and the roast chicken are probably one of those things where, like, maybe it recovers more health and stamina when you eat it, but it can go bad. Versus the rations, um, they don't recover as much when you are resting, I guess, uh, but they, they can't go bad. So let's see. I guess I'm assuming this price here is for the whole stack. Because I don't see where, like, it just says amount 14. I don't, um, maybe there will be a pop-up. There we go. Point of the food rations. I'll let you have it for 29 burlas. How do we... Hmm. I, there doesn't seem to be a way to split it. The game's not showing me. So I, I don't know if you can buy fewer than 14 rations for 29 burlas. In a lot of games, if you hold down shift and click and drag, then it'll, it'll attempt to split. But when I do that here, a shift left click just creates a right click effect. So, hmm. Okay, well, we're going to need all the food we can get anyway, so uh, I hate to spend that much money. That's like almost half our cash, but... Okay, oh, wait, it goes down here. Okay, but it did give us 16 rations total. Okay, so I guess that maybe that's just the quantity they sell. Like, you can just buy in lots of 14. Uh, now, fortunately, we can buy more. That wasn't all that they had, so. Rest. Uh, I guess we don't need to do that at the moment. So. Okay, we'll exit. Let's explore the rest of Briala. Mark's Goods. Oh, I forgot we're going to need to go back and explore that, um the fountain as well. I'm guessing it's like a wishing well thing. Maybe we can take a few burlas out and we can, um, like, you know, throw them in for good luck or something. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Now we've got new stuff. There's Sin Water. And we can buy 25 for 52 burlas. An armorer's hammer. We can buy 14 of those for 33 burlas. We can flip the hammer end over end into the air, catching it by the haft. Too light to be useful in battle, it was just the thing for patching up any chinks in his, arm, uh, his armor developed. I don't want to buy 14 of those all at once, maybe, but um, I do want to get some because he has the repair skill and we want it to level up, and Aaron's armor already started out damaged. So... Um, I have to say that Betrayal at Krondor is a game that, like, I tried and failed to get very far into it the first few times that I started a game. And I wound up having to kind of grind to level my skills up and make my characters tougher and more effective warriors before I could get anywhere. So, it, since this is very similar and is a spiritual successor built in a similar engine and so forth, um, we may wind up having to do that. If we can find some bandits or something to, you know, kill for their gold, uh, then that means that we're going to need these, but also we will be able to afford them likewise. Let's see, a bucket. The wooden slats of the bucket had warped a little with age, but it still seemed watertight. There's only one of those. I feel like that's going to be relevant. Ah, the braided cord looks strong enough to support a person's weight. Rope was also important in Betrayal at Krondor. A lot of these, like, seemingly random supplies uh, we will need in order to overcome specific challenges or perhaps to do things like, um, you know, you may be in a dungeon area and certain parts, uh, certain rooms are only available or certain chests can only be opened if you have things like 
rope or shovels or torches or something. Okay, this shovel, a humble tool but sturdy. Their craftsmen hadn't cut any corners. William didn't plan on digging any privy ditches, but he'd hate to stumble across buried treasure unprepared. Oh, well then we... Oh, God, we're going to have to buy a shovel then. Torch. Uh, the club-like stick was wrapped at one end with cloth, which had been thoroughly soaked in oil and pitch. William couldn't tell how long it would burn once lit, but he knew torches were usually good for most of a day. That's helpful. And there's our whetstones. William ran his finger along the edge of the whetstone. The friction it would create with a sword would help smooth out the nicks the weapon picked up in combat. So we will need armorer's hammers. We will need whetstones. I am going to buy this bucket. Um, because you know we're going to need a bucket at some point. Now the rope. I'm also going to go ahead and buy some rope. And I'm going to buy some torches. Everything else will have to wait. We will come back. I'm, I'm glad that they sell healing items here um, for sure. And once we figure out how these work and which one we need to use when, we're going to have to replenish our stock, of course. Uh, we will definitely need to come back for armorers, hammers, uh, for whetstones, for shovels, and presumably at some point for fishing rods. But right now we're down to 21 burlas. So, not this instant. Well, before I spend all of our money. Okay, now he is carrying all of this stuff. His strength is still 24 of 24, so that's good. I wasn't sure whether or not, like, it might decrease as he was carrying things. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Here we go, I came in here for this. Okay, and it looks like that's why they sell them in stacks of 14, is because that is a full stack. It's because that makes sense. That's two weeks worth of food for one person, or one week worth of food for two people. So... Um, but if this inventory screen fills up, I don't know if we have, like, limited backpack slots or something. We'll, we'll see. We'll figure it out. Um, the shape, size, and imperial portrait featured on the Burla had changed many times in the Empire's history. Yet the coin's gold content, the foundation of the region's economic stability, remained constant. You have a better economy than we do. Can't use an inventory item on an item still in the room. Oh. Oh, okay. Aha. So I was correct. There was a coin in the wishing fountain here. And you can see that it's gone now. I... That was my first assumption. And then, um... Okay, nice. Nice. Actually, there's like five or six coins in there. Um, and w when I couldn't get it by just left-clicking on it, I thought maybe it was supposed to be the opposite interaction we needed to, um, uh, to put a coin in. And so that was my clue when it said an item that's still in the room. It's because they told, they told us this. You have to click and drag an item and drop it on a character's portrait to put it in their inventory. So there were coins in the fountain. I was just clicking and not clicking and dragging. Okay, so let's see. This over here is that farm. So this is going to be the, the southernmost area. Um, there is another shop right here. Okay, there we go. So we can right-click. Mark's Goods. The Spitting Lion Inn. Tier Cordelaine. So let's see what this is. A man cleaned out milking pails in a well swept, tidy farmyard. At Aaron's greeting, he looked up from his chore. A sunburned, worried face looked out from beneath a broad brimmed straw hat. A brown, calloused hand clasped Aaron's. Hello, Lonzo. My father says you haven't dropped into the spitting line for several weeks. Got another two headed calf keeping you up nights? Lonzo pulled a straw out of his hat and sucked on it meditatively. <laughs> All my calves is acting like they got two heads, Aaron. All my calves. That was a weird way to say that. I'm sorry. I wasn't predicting the end of the sentence. 
All my calves is acting like they got two heads, Aaron. First they go one way, then they go to the other, then they fall down in a heap. It's a pitiful sight. Aaron took a look inside the barn to see the calves for himself. The little creatures tried to stand, but lost their balance and fell to their knees. The worried cows nuzzled their babies and looked to the humans for help. What can we do? I've run through all I know about bovine diseases, Aaron. Doc Myers and Balmestre might be able to save them, though, if you know of anyone going down that way. The farmer's voice trailed off as he looked at his stricken herd. Aaron promised to try to get the message to Doc Myers. After wishing Lonzo luck, Aaron turned away from the sunny farmyard, the bleats of the stricken creature loud in his ears. Okay. So what we have here is our first side quest, then. Okay, let's see here. Um... Let's drag an other seal. This is something interesting. Okay. I'm going to put... Lonzo's farm. There we go. Okay. Now, and we have more of these, so... But when I right-click now, it says Lonzo's Farm. Awesome. Okay, I love being able to add my own map notes. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. I love that, love that, love that in any game. And in a big open world game like this with a lot of exploration available, um, that is a critical tool. Okay, so that seems like our first side quest. Let's head back over here to this area that we missed. Party's getting tired and should rest soon. Oh my gosh, you weaklings. A familiar voice called through the open door. Aaron, what are you doing out on the steps? Come in, come in. Aaron entered the kitchen through billowing clouds of flour. He could dimly make out the, the billowing form of Mrs. Miller, so lots of billowing going on, kneading a small mountain of dough. She spoke rapidly, keeping time with her vigorous movements. I'd give you a hug, but you'd probably wind up in the oven with this week's loaves. Besides, if I know young men in love, you didn't come to see me at all. Laura is down at the well gathering water. That girl is a marvel. Such a beauty, yet so eager to help out around the house. You're a lucky fellow to catch her eye. Why, all the men in the village. Hmm. Aaron murmured, Thank you kindly, and good day to you, Mrs. Miller, and slipped out the door. And the clouds of flour hid his escape. As he headed down the path, Aaron heard Mrs. Miller continue the song of her daughter's virtues. Okay, so I don't know if Aaron is just, like, not into this small-town girl-next-door kind of thing with Laura. Um, or if maybe his, her mom's just kind of overbearing and he doesn't want to deal with her. There go, a little bit of resting. Okay, let's see the... What was that? Did you hear that? Just that kind of... Oh... Uh... Did somebody's skills go up? Or something? No spell being researched currently. Oh! Oh, I think that was a notification that, uh... Yeah, I think he finished learning. Um, static discharge. I don't see where we can get to it. Because we can't access our list of combat spells. So I don't know for sure. <laughs> Um, but I think that that's what that sound was, is that was an indicator that, uh, that he learned Static Discharge, because you saw down here, uh, that it said, you know, no spells currently being researched, and we cannot click on these, because the only spell I guess we have learned that all three of these combined to make has been fully researched, so. Okay, and this is, uh, this is gonna be Laura. Hi, Laura. How are you? Aaron, how nice to see you. Oh, uh, she's sweet. This is going to be hard for you to understand, Laura. Cor, it's hard for me to understand. Don't take Cor's name in vain, Aaron. Sorry. 
Anyhow, Laura, it looks like I can... That I have this gift. I think I can do magic. Whatever are you talking about, Aaron Coeur I think I have magical abilities. I'm not sure, but I've got to find out. And I can't do that if I stay in Briala. But what am I supposed to do if you leave? I don't know. Stay with your mother and father. Help out with the children. It's not that I don't care about you, Laura, because I do. But I could set the whole town on fire by accident if I don't go to wizard school, so... Yeah, I mean... It's, it's not bad. Laura, I won't be around here for a while. Oh, really? Is your dad sending you to Amatsi for supplies? I wish we were married so I could go with you. I've never been to Amatsi. No, Laura. I'm not going to Imatsi, and I don't know when I'll be back. Like, it's not the best voice acting we've heard so far, but it's not bad. Okay, so... We're, we're sorry, but... <laughs> when am I going to see you again? I don't know. Soon. Don't worry. Things will work out for the best. Look, I gotta go now. Take care of yourself, Laura. I'll miss you. Come home soon, Aaron. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, now that was bad. Yes. Aaron has met William, and now he's discovering that he has this thing called options. No one answered Aaron's knock. However, a cacophony of squeals and curses issuing from the backyard indicated the presence of someone or something. Stepping gingerly through the mud and garbage, the party walked to the rear of the house to find a monster writhing about in a pit of mire and dung. A limb of the monster rose up, detached itself, and came toward them. Uh... Bristles and lard, what the sow tail do you want? The muck-covered blob grunted. Aaron hesitated. Uh, what with all the noise, we thought maybe someone was being murdered back here. But we won't bother you. You seem to have your hands full, sir. Sir, is it? Don't trouble with me, boy. Can't you tell a sow from a boar? The lump of dirt wiped a hand across its face, revealing beady black eyes and a few wisps of hair. Aaron blushed. I I'm sorry, ma'am. No insult intended. And none there'll be if you'll lend a trotter and help me gather up these piglets. Oh, okay. Okay, something else just leveled up, I guess. So we need to be listening for that sound effect. Although it doesn't seem, like, easy to miss, which is good. Disregarding their clothes and their dignity, the heroes stumbled and lunged after the piglets. Finally, they rounded up all the squealing, wriggling creatures and stuck them back in their pen. Lard love ya, let me give you a great big hog. The pig farmer threw her arms around Aaron in an embrace that left a lasting impression on his clothes, if not his emotions. A great big hog? That has to be a joke. The party rinsed off as best they could in the pig's watering trough, laughing at each other's altered appearance. Well, at least that wasn't boring, William quipped as they hit the road again. Oh. Oh, game developers, why? Why? Uh, his stealth is red. Current value 16 of 16, previous value 15. Hmm. Uh, I don't know why. I guess maybe that went up? Perhaps? It doesn't look like, like lockpicking or mailing or anything else has. And his stealth went up as well, 13 of 13. Okay, so maybe they got plus one stealth from doing that because they had to sneak up on the pigs or something. Yeah, because see, now it's gray. Like, it took a minute for it to kick in. So yeah, it looks like they got plus one stealth for free from doing that, I think, is what happened. Okay, huh. Well, that's cool. Uh, it just goes to show you that, you know, you should be helping people catch their pigs. Okay, so now we need to go over here and we will visit uh, this building on the other side of Laura. Aaron walked up the path to the Master Cooper's residence, the largest house in Briala. 
Okay, so I guess, like, they're trying to represent the village as a little bit bigger than it actually appears on the map and in those three-dimensional models of the houses that are actually in the world. Um, because I was wondering how it was that in a town this small, Aaron didn't know the pig farmer. Master Cooper's son, Eugene, answered the door. He was a strapping youth, a bit loud but good heart. Aaron had known him since the two boys were babes. Hey, babe, says Aaron. Uh, Aaron introduced William to Eugene, who eyed his noble garb in a speculative fashion before offering his hand. Eugene's handshake was so hearty that William winced. Uh, Eugene's into it. It's good to meet you too, Eugene. And now, would you mind giving me that back while there's still something left of it? Eugene guffawed. I'm glad you showed up, Aaron. There's something I've been meaning to talk to you about. And you should listen to this too, my lord. It'll no doubt be of great interest to one such as yourself. I'll say it once and once only. Chickens. And what is it about chickens, you ask? Aaron, having heard many of Eugene's get-rich-quick schemes before, tried to pull William away, but William's interest seems to be aroused. Do tell me, good friend, just what is it about chickens? Eugene took a deep breath. They're economical. You feed them table scraps and a handful of corn, and they produce eggs, meat, and best of all, chicken manure, or as I call it, white gold. Now, I have a friend, he's a real genius with chicken manure. Even as we speak, he's experimenting with 17 new uses for stuff, things no one's ever thought of before. William's enthusiasm seemed to know no bounds. Really? Oh, do go on. What does your friend the genius do with them? Why, practically everything. He makes candles out of them, and soap. They concentrate in forms full of vitamins and minerals. Oh my god. Aaron cut in, disgusted. You don't think he suggests eating it? Of course not. You feed it to catfish, they'll eat anything. Oh, thank God. The most exciting experiments involve collecting the gas from the stuff and using it to make controlled explosions, which then can... Well, I, I don't understand all that complicated stuff myself, but my friend says all he needs is a paltry contribution from a few understanding investors such as yourselves. That joyman Scott Gratizzi was in town a day or so ago telling tales of magic and a mage he saw in Medova. To hear him tell the story, you almost think he could cast magic. Well, anyway, before he headed south, I mentioned my proposal and he said he might be interested in a small investment. William laughed and Aaron sighed loudly. Eugene, it sounds like a fascinating experiment. We don't have the money to back you. Maybe some other time. Uh, it was great seeing you, but we've got to get going. As he closed the door, Aaron reflected on Eugene's statement about his old friend Scott knowing magic. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we have gotten tired again. I, I guess we should probably... Wow, it is, like, really hard to find your way around the dark. back here and rest since we can apparently do it for free. And it looks like Tyr is gone. I guess he's just inside maybe because it's... There we go. Okay, so they do charge us our own food when we rest. So it's the same as camping. Interesting. His dad is gone, though. I, I thought he just went inside maybe because it was dark, but... That's the pig farmer, right? No, it's not. Wait. Party knocked on the door and waited, but nobody answered. Either nobody's home or they don't want to be disturbed. Aaron said maybe we should move on. Oh, no, this is the pig farmer's house. That's the miller's house. Okay, my bad. All right, we got one more house over here. Let's check it out and see what's going on there. The yard was littered with rubbish and broken bottles. Spokeless cartwheels grinned up through the weeds like toothless mouths. As the party picked their way toward the door, it burst open a half-dressed woman flying like a cannonball in their direction. Okay, so I guess they're trying to paint this as like, this is the, uh, the medieval fantasy equivalent of the local redneck house, you know, with like... Uh, a tire rim in the front yard, a car up on blocks, like that kind of nasty stereotype, uh, the white trash stereotype. 
Aaron, step forward bravely. Mrs. Durkins, I'd like to introduce... I don't want to meet none of your low-life friends, Aaron Coeur d'Alene. You kids are nothing but a bad influence on my poor beau, always getting him drunk and in trouble. <laughs> Mrs. D, Bo's the one who forced his way into our wine cellar. Uh, true, my little brother gave him the key, but only after Bo threatened him. Bo is seven years older and thrice as big, after all. Mrs. Durkins grabbed a wheel spoke off the ground and brandished it like a sword. I don't need to listen to a bunch of lies about my sweet, gentle Bobo. Get off my property now, or I'll have your mother take the strap to the lot of you. Hmm. Okay. Well. Um. So. It looks like uh, that is pretty much all of Briala. It looks like maybe this does move a little bit because this down here is much closer to the bottom of the frame than it was. So let's see. Uh, just in case, let's put... and this will be the pig farmer and this is the master cooper's house with Eugene They had that as one word, but I don't for a moment believe that it is. There is a keystroke delay going on here. But the system works, and that's all that really matters. And Mrs. Durkin's house. There we go. Okay. So, um, well. We've got a lot of stuff that we need to follow up on. Uh, we've got a lot of exploring to do. First of all, he mentioned a mage in Medova, but we would have to pass Imatsi to get all the way over there, which is the town, like the next town over, I'm assuming, is kind of what that is. I mean, obviously it's literally the next town over, but I mean in a countryfied sense, right? Um, they're trying to paint the folk of Briala as people who have never gone 10 miles from home in their whole lives. They live and die in this village. Um, but the guy, Scott, who was the, uh, the traveling joyman, the, which means storyteller uh, or bard or what have you, um, who mentioned to the mage might know something about magic and he went south. So maybe we should be looking for him in Aspreza, perhaps? And we also are going to have to do some thorough exploring of uh, the, the wilderness. Because in the first place, uh, we need to find someone that we can kill for cash. Uh, or we need to find monsters that are carrying money. Or we need to find money somewhere. Um, so that we can buy like armorers, hammers, uh, whetstones, shovels things like that. More rations, for sure. We want to always have, like, too much food, because you see how quickly time goes in this game. Um, but we also need to be on the lookout for things like hidden treasure chests, because those were all over the place in Betrayal at Krondor, and I am sure that they are going to be the same way here. They had these really cool, like, riddle locks on them, um, where some of them were generic riddles and then some of them required that you had to kind of know like the the lore 
of Midkemia, of the, the world, you know, in the Rift War series. Um, like the names of the elves and, and you know, stuff like that. So, um, I'm hoping for a similar experience in Betrayal and Antara. Uh, so, yeah. They mention in Motsi, but, like, that's not really where we're going. We're actually headed over here to Panitso. And I'm guessing that means that we need to go to a like a harbor town to get there so he can sort of level up into a, a real wizard so we are probably either going to Balmestri Sortiga or or Ormeid or Maid perhaps Ormide. Um but one of these three towns I'm assuming is where we need to be headed to uh, but he also said the governor was expecting William so I'm not sure if that means that we're supposed to be going to Antara um we can explore all of these different places. If it's truly open world, we can go any direction that we want. And if it's not truly open world, because some of the criticisms that I have read about Antara in preparing for this series um, are that it's a bit more linear than Betrayal at Grondor. So that may mean that we can count on the game to stop us from going certain places and kind of force us in the direction that we should be headed. Um... We definitely do need to go this direction uh, in order to find, what's his name, Doc Murray or Doc McCoy or something? I've already forgotten. Um, but we need to find the Doc so that we can complete that side quest about Lonzo's calves. Um, I'm guessing that means we're probably going to head to Imatsi next. But if you want to try a different direction, I'm all ears. Be sure to let me know. Um, you know, either here in the chat, this stream, or next stream. Um, you can, if you're watching on YouTube then, you know, absolutely put your thoughts in the comments and uh, give me a like and a follow over there on the YouTube channel as well. And you can hit me up on Twitter and Facebook and Pillow Fort and message me in any of those locations. Let me know what you want to see from the next stream because uh, we're about out of time for this one. So I am already having fun. I mean, we just started. We didn't really do much because we're just learning our way around the game. But I like the way that it looks. Um, I eh, I have my criticisms about how it handles, but so far it's not been a problem, and like I'll get used to it. At least combat is turn-based, um, and I don't have to worry about it. How in my Magic Six or Seven, you know, I might have to actively navigate using the arrow keys, and then that keystroke delay could be a big problem. But I don't think that's going to be the case here. So um, so far, I'm I'm hooked. I'm interested. I'm satisfied, and I am already having a good time. So I am thrilled that you guys picked this game for me to play, um, and I'm excited to continue my first blind playthrough on the channel when we come back next Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York and Miami time here in the U.S. where I'm at. I hope that I'll see you then, and don't forget to join me Mondays and Thursdays for my other series as well, both solo on Thursdays and with my wonderful husband, Specific Pixel, on Monday evenings at 7. I'll see you there. Thanks for being here. Thanks for picking out this game. I hope that you had a good time as well. And as always, thanks for playing.